So why are we here? We're here because I think, I think that brain imaging, while wonderful and informative, has its limits. And all the work we put into this for, for many, many years, in the end, has given us a lot of information, but hasn't really changed the human condition as much as I thought it would 30 years ago when I started as an undergrad in, a, in an imaging lab. I suspected, oh, maybe a decade, maybe two, I'll be old then, but we'll have everything figured out, or at least enough to make this worthwhile. There's still millions of schizophrenics, people still dying of alcoholism. We've learned a lot about all of that, but it hasn't really turned into treatment. And what we have learned, a lot of it is limited by the fact that uh, imaging itself is a correlational technique. You see covariance. We make a lot of assumptions about causality, but it's difficult to prove. And there might be hidden variables affecting the variables that we see that are more important than the variables we see. So there's that. And so the combination of those two suggests that imaging could benefit from the addition of ways to use that information and to use those technologies integrated with imaging to help. And these many years of studies, uh, I've, I've been working on these questions for a long time um, in a lot of different ways. And initially in basic uh, cognitive neuroscience, mostly visual perception, but uh, some attention work and so on. And then um, starting about 15 years ago, looking more at uh, clinical disorders like Huntington's disease, dementia, and most recently, we finished up a 10-year study showing that we could predict relapse in recovering stimulant addicts um, based in large part on the amplitude of response in posterior cingulate, insula, and anterior cingulate in uh, uh, a version of the oddball task. When I found this, I thought, great, 10 years have paid off. I discovered something that nobody knew before. Maybe we can help people who are trying to recover from drug drug addiction. But going to treatment providers, they say, hey, these are really pretty pictures. But I sit down with people in an office and try and talk them out of uh, using. This has nothing to do with how we treat our patients. But how can we use this information? How can we use it to help? And also a lot of work in schizophrenia. So in the end, I, I reached a turning point saying, all this work in neuroimaging, what can we do with it? How can we really apply it? The main problem, I think, is that um, clinical disorders today, psychiatric disorders, are treated primarily by pharmaceuticals. And how do you turn most imaging data into a pharmaceutical treatment? There are ways to help guide, but the, but the connection is very diffuse and very difficult. And there's pharmaceutical companies that have poured millions into imaging and then taken it right back out again when they realized, oh my gosh, <laughs> we just wasted a lot of money. Pharmaceuticals are not the best way to use imaging data. My suspicion, and I suspect a lot of people who are, who are here today, realize that stimulation by its direct anatomical uh, influence of specific brain networks might be a much better way to use the imaging data that we have, all this understanding we've gained after decades of study, in a way that's going to help people that have these disorders. So and just as a, as a trial, and starting in 2007, we did a, a, a combination of imaging and stimulation where um, we had people uh, look for threats that were hidden in images that look like this. And um, it's hard to see, but there's a shadow of a sniper right here. So our subjects saw images like this. They had to indicate if they saw a threat or not and uh, with a button press, a forced choice, yes, no button press. And we did an imaging study. Um, we identified regions of cortex that were accessible to TDCS, then ran a series of TDCS studies. And lo and behold, by placing those electrodes where the fMRI data indicated got a doubling, up to a doubling of learning rate and performance. And it was huge. And in the first study, we didn't really believe it. So we replicated 
four more times using a variety of placements. And um, the fMRI data predicted the results of the stimulation to a really high degree. So as, as a first proof of principle, um, we found a phenomenon that where we could use imaging to direct stimulation. We could replicate. We found a dose-response effect, an effective electrode position that, again, was predicted by the fMRI data. Um, sensation artifacts didn't seem to matter. The benefits lasted at least a day after stimulation. Um, I suspect a lot longer, but that's the longest we've tested so far. We find that TDCS alters neurochemistry and effective connectivity in the brain and uh, alters attention in a way that seems to benefit this learning task. So after a few years of study, I'm convinced it works. Doubling learning rate and, and is huge. It's a huge effect. Um, so as a proof of principle, that this series of studies and many of the studies we'll see in the next two days I think help us to understand that combining imaging and stimulation provides a lot of benefits. Um, you, we can better understand how stimulation works using imaging. We can use imaging to increase the efficacy of stimulation on affecting behavior. And ultimately, my ultimate goal is to provide safer, cheaper, and more effective treatments for brain and mental illness. So, uh, Last year, we had a special issue of NeuroImage come out. Um, we've had a, a few sessions at uh, the human brain mapping meeting. And this year, we decided to, to do this. Um, another thing to consider is that the work we're doing now is really just the beginning. Probably any form of energy that you can transmit through the skull done in the right way is going to affect neural activity. It turns out, one, one thing for me coming out of this is that the brain is much more responsive to its environment, its physical environment, than I ever expected. But a tiny little current or ultrasound or even light at the correct frequency appears to alter neural activity through, through various mechanisms that we're still learning about. Um, if you include all this together, Already, there's a possibility of an essentially infinite number of stimulation protocols. So finally, I think imaging will help us weed through all the possibilities that we have and select the ones that would be best for a specific application. Um, 